Welcome to part one of three in this heritage talk on barrows, burials and the Bronze Age at Doveridge. I'm your speaker, Emma Carter. Before we begin, we'd like to thank Bellway Homes and Lampro Services Limited for commissioning Wessex Archaeology to excavate this exciting site. You can join me for part one now, where Patrick and I explore the history and background of barrows, burials and the Bronze Age at Doveridge. On the southwestern fringe of the Derbyshire Dales is a small village called Doveridge. It's a typical English village with a pub, a local shop and a working men's club. And there's also a rather picturesque stone bridge over the River Dove, which is a meandering tributary of the River Trent. So with the bridge and the river, this gives us a few clues about the village's place name. But if we scratch the surface a bit more, we'll discover its ancient history beneath our feet. So Doveridge is quite old, that's even mentioned in the Doomsday Book, and when Wessex archaeology started excavations in 2017, they found evidence of people being in the area dating back even further than that by a few thousand years. When our archaeologists got on site, their excavations revealed a large circular ditch. It was 22 metres in diameter and it's called a ring ditch. The ring ditch enclosed six cremation burials, and one of the cremation burials revealed a complete inverted collared urn containing the undisturbed remains of three individuals. And this is where it gets really interesting. So our team of archeologists had actually discovered a round barrow. And this is an ancient funerary monument and this one dates back to the early Bronze Age. So this in of itself, is actually quite the contribution to our historic record as there was nothing to previously suggest that a ram barrow was even there. But the real jewel in the archaeological crown and the story which we'll be telling you focuses on the complete and inverted collared urn. So to give you an idea of just how special this is, it's perhaps a once in a career or a once in a lifetime find. So often, our excavations, we encounter that some of the archaeological landscape has been lost to the plough, so those years of agriculture steadily reducing the level and the likelihood for archaeological remains to be found fully intact. So to find the collard urn complete and in situ, so that's its original deposit, this gave us a unique opportunity to apply scientific analysis to reveal who these people were and what their burial rites say about them. And so with that, I hope you're looking forward to this Wessex webinar on barrows, burials and the Bronze Age at Doveridge. Now, already in describing this site, we've used some quite technical language and to help us unravel all things from the technical language to the background of barrows, I'm joined by Patrick. Lovely to Hi. see you there. I think you've got one of the really interesting jobs at Wessex. So could you tell me a little bit more about what your job is and what it involves? Okay, my job title is research officer. Uh, and what that means is that I spend my time uh, writing reports and publications about the, um, the finds and the sites that our field teams excavate. Um, so taking that knowledge from the site and uh, making it public. And the site I've been working on recently is this um, barrow at Doveridge. But what is a barrow? It's nothing to do with a wheelbarrow, is it? No, um, barrows are um, the big heaps of uh, stone and uh, rocks and earth, that kind of thing. Um, they're generally prehistoric in date. Um, a lot were built in the Neolithic and Bronze Age. Um, they come in various shapes and sizes. And the sort we're talking about today, the Doveridge Barrow, that's um, a round barrow. Um, and they tend to be Bronze Age, so we're talking um, about three and a half to four and a half thousand years ago. Um, they were often, um, but crucially not always, um, used as burial places, um, burial places uh, for the dead. Um, you can, you know, often get barrows which don't actually contain any human remains, which make us think that perhaps some or uh, Perhaps some had other functions. Um, they could have been marking territories or, or gathering points. 
they seem to coincide with a time in our history when people were starting to be obviously concerned about um, marking territory in the landscape. Um, so they might have had that kind of function and the addition of human remains to them might have sort of given them a, a bit more power in the eyes of the people who were building them and, and living alongside them. So they sound like quite important features on the landscape. How rare are they? Um, nationally, they're, they're not particularly rare. Um, the sort of figure that you often hear is there are sort of 10,000 in the country. And within the Peak District, that's the area we're talking about today, um, Doveridge being sort of on the fringes of the Peak District. And there's uh, 500 known, roughly, about records wow. of 500, not all surviving now, but um, that, that kind of ballpark. Um, so not particularly rare, but it's very rare to find one that nobody knew was there. And that's what we did at Doveridge. Um, because they're quite prominent monuments, because they sort of stick up above the land surface, you know, they were sort of built to be seen. Um, they've been conspicuous for, for thousands of years often. Um, so that means that they've attracted attention through the centuries and uh, especially in the 18th and 19th century when um, archaeology as a discipline was just getting going and people sort of started to be interested in, in excavating um, archaeological sites. Um, a lot of them were excavated then by people who were expecting to find, you know, the the common conception of like a kingly burial um, with it's lots of treasure and gold. Yeah, they're actually <laughs> very atypical um, within British prehistory, but nevertheless, um, a lot of them were opened in the sort of 18th and 19th century. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of instances, uh, not all necessarily, but in a lot of instances, um, the records of what those sort of early burrow diggers found uh, a little bit sketchy. They're, they're, they're quite lacking. Um, obviously, they wouldn't have been recording things and the, the same sorts of things um, to the standards that we would today. Um, and as big heaps of rock and earth, um, a lot of them were dug into by, um, say, for instance, farm workers um, looking for a stone to build, um, dry stone walls, enclosures, that kind of thing, sort of seen as convenient quarries. So sometimes, you know, they'd stumble across human remains. Yeah, so you do get records of them being sort of found by accident as well. Um, so we can't, you know, begrudge that sort of damage too much in a way because, you know, that that is the archaeology of archaeology, you know, that's that's the yes, beginning of our discipline. that's our record, doesn't it? So, Patrick, why are barrows important and what can they tell us? Um, they can tell us lots of different things, really. Um, they can contain clues about what the environment was like uh, surrounding the barrow at, at the time the, the barrow was built and in, and in use. Um, for instance, if it was like in a wooded area, or if it had been deforested, um, uh, if it was like a, a grassy area, or um, if cereal crops, you know, arable crops were growing nearby, if, if people were, were farming sort of fields around there. Um, the finds that we might find within the barrow can um, tell us about links that the people who built the barrow, the, the links that they had with other parts of the country. Um, if they contain human remains, we can um, discern things about the uh, the way the dead were treated in prehistory, um, the sort of uh, the funerary rite, um, and kind of what that tells us about how those people kind of saw the world. Um, you can get sort of quite technical and and do um, sort of various scientific studies, uh, scientific analyses and find out where the um, the individuals buried at the Barrow, um, where they might have grown up or, or spent time in their lives, um, what sort of different parts of the country sort of track uh, population movement. Um, and uh, theoretically, um, if people from Barrows, from that Barrow or 
across uh, different barrow sites if those people were related to each other. You know, if, if you're very lucky, if you can get that um, DNA evidence, if the bone's well enough preserved. Um, at a more abstract level, at a more abstract level, we can see um, sort of how people viewed the human body. Um, there's a lot of evidence that it wasn't considered sort of very problematic to um, the word, you know, it, it's a bad phrase in a way, but sort of mess around with human bodies. Um, it wasn't seen as problematic to disturb the remains of the dead and rearrange body parts. Um, so we're getting a sense of the different attitudes people had to the, to the body and the dead and potentially death. You know, we, we're seeing how people might have viewed their own mortality um, and their, their place in the cosmos. So it's quite a range, isn't it? You know, it's, it's from very specific questions about the landscape to, you know, um, life's big questions, really. Um, and also because populations in, in later times, say like, you know, the Roman period, um, they had their own interactions um, with barrows. You know, they, they placed things on the ground near them or buried things in them. So we get a sense of um, what the monuments meant to those people too. So, um, but barrows, barrows connect us with our past, but also people in the past, it, connected them with their past. Um, so they're really sort of connective monuments. Um, so they're a rich source of information about attitudes to um, time and changing circumstances um, across history. Lots of things they can tell us. That's absolutely fascinating. So with that, could you tell us a little bit more about our barrow at Doveridge and perhaps why we were even there? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so Doveridge, it's about halfway between um, Birmingham, Birmingham and Sheffield. Um, and we were digging there in, well, we started there in 2017 um, ahead of a housing development, uh, a new housing uh, project. And that's quite usual for us, isn't it? Because we often go ahead as part of some sort of scheme. And uh, yeah. Yes, we'll be uh, called in by the sort of county council's archaeological advisors to undertake sort of exploratory work something like that and did we do we have an indication of or any works that had gone prior to this that perhaps gave us clues as to what we might find there'd been a, a, a geophysical survey uh, carried out that had revealed um a, a, a few anomalies that's the the technical term um blobs under the ground had, had been found by this this technology which sort of scans beneath the ground to to see if there could be anything buried there um Do those blobs have archaeological potential but sometimes um sometimes yeah um sometimes it's kind of very obvious that here be archaeology sometimes it's a, a little bit more equivocal um there was enough there for us to uh, be asked to dig sort of exploratory trial trenches. Um, so we, we opened a few of those. Um, and in doing so, we found some uh, small pits that had been dug into the, the sort of ancient ground surface um, and they contained cremated human bone. Um, so we um, applied for the necessary license to uh, disturb human remains um, and opened up a bigger area and in doing so exposed this this ring ditch um the the barrow site proper wow so what did the barrow actually look like then um you could see vaguely a uh, a ring ditch which is like which is like a a donut shaped ditch uh on the ground uh, and there was a very low mound of of gravel um the, the the natural geology of the site was was kind of gravelly and then digging the ring ditch the sort of upcast from that had been heaped into the in, into the middle of the enclosed area um but over the years it had been mostly sort of plowed flat so there wasn't really very much of it gosh and were there any clues that the barrow would be there other than the geophysical results um not really not not so much in in the local area there's a, a few records of um 
Bronze Age um, metalwork uh, tools or weapons mm -hmm. being found um, in and around Doveridge, but the uh, the records are uh, you know fairly inaccurate as, as to where they were found. So there wasn't anything from this site in particular. Um, but sort of panning back a bit, it, it kind of makes sense that, and and by that I mean. Um, so Dove Ridge, it's alongside the River Dove. And if you follow the River Dove up, upstream, you get to Dovedale. <clears throat> so that's the, the, the headwaters of the, of the Dove. Mm -hmm. um, potentially sort of uh, familiar to some people listening to this today. Um, Dovedale, it's quite a sort of a popular picnic spot. Um, Reynard's Cave, Stepping Stones, all that kind of thing. Um, and in the area around Dovedale, um, there are lots and lots of barrows upon the uh, in the limestone of the White Peak. Um, it's a real hot spot on the map for for barrows. And similarly, if you follow the um, the River Dove downstream from Dove Ridge, um, as you said, it leads to the River Trent. Um, and there are quite a lot of barrow um, concentrations along the Trent as well. Um, in prehistory, there seems to have been like a real fascination, a real sort of preoccupation um, with the river systems. Um, and you can see that within the distribution of barrows. So although the particular Doveridge site itself, there were no clear indications of barrow potential, I think you'd have to say situated between those two hotspots um, and sort of seen through Bronze Age eyes, it was uh, potentially a good place for a barrow. Yeah. Wow. I really think we've got you know, such potential in the landscape then, haven't we? So certainly the next time I go through the Peak District, I'm going to be looking out for like rivers and, and ridges. Certainly so is... on, on some of the hilltops, you know, the, the barrows are still um, very visible. Um, but with this Doveridge barrow, because it had been hidden away and, and ploughed flat, it basically survived those those. Um, 18th and 19th century barrow diggers. Um, Lucky for us. And then we found it, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Patrick. So there you guys have it. Okay, thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching part one of this Heritage Talk. If you want to find out what it was like to lift a 3,000-year-old cremation urn, click like and subscribe to our channel for part two. But... If you can't wait for that archaeological fix, check out the other videos on our YouTube channel now.